All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the second day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. If you've watched my recent videos, you know that um, I was not happy last Sunday attending church. In fact, I was pretty much disgusted. But the thing is, it's not a one-time deal. It's not simply because of what happened that day. It's an ongoing thing that's been building. And uh, <clears throat> it is consistent with my experience in the past with Fundamentalist Baptists and also my long experience with Fundamentalist Baptists going back 40 some years. Uh, and not just them, the charismatic movement, the uh, uh, attended a Nazarene church here that's sort of in my neighborhood because of disgust with other things. Uh, for some of the years in there, um, I mean, we, we were, uh, my wife and I did church, or I did it. She assisted uh, in some other things, um, like when it came to distributing uh, communion. Uh, for at least seven years. So during that period, Sunday morning, that's where we were uh, because nobody else was there. It was simply meeting a need and nobody else was doing it. So that's what we ended up doing there. So we weren't involved in other churches then. I'd visit sometimes, but... And I've been pastor in a couple churches for a short time in the past, including a Southern Baptist and a Christian church. So during those times, I mean, when I preach Christ, unless if I'm in my right mind, that's what I'm preaching. I'm preaching Jesus Christ. Christ crucified, what Christ did for us on the cross. I'm preaching the new covenant. Unless I lose my mind and wander off into Job, which is what I regret most of all. Oh, Lord, God, forgive me for that. That was at the nursing home, of all places. Mm. That must have been under the influence of Calvinism. Yes, that was uh, not satisfying either. So, again, I, I was raised as a Lutheran in the American Lutheran Church. Went through, you know, baptized... Uh, we did. We weren't in one. Our, my dad had to move around a lot because he's a professional, or was a professional, and um, I didn't understand that then, but I do now. Uh, the corporations would like want to consolidate, want to move uh, their people into their headquarters, and their headquarters was places like Chicago. And my dad left jobs uh, more than once, I think, because he didn't want his family to live in those places. So he would um, take a different job to keep us away from that environment. And I didn't understand that at the time. I didn't understand it until, um, you know, I was well, you know, after he was gone, really, uh, thinking back and because, uh, well, Lutherans don't wear their faith on their sleeve. And, uh, it's, they're not open about talking about Christ, and they're very much like Mennonites. <laughs> uh, well, actually, Mennonites do wear their faith on their sleeve, in their garb, but, 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 um, the quiet people, sort of, the Lutherans are are not aggressive. 
I've never heard of an aggressive Lutheran. Well, I guess there might be one out there, but he wasn't doesn't raised as a Lutheran. I was thinking of Chris Rosero. He is, he's a little bit on the aggressive side. But he was not raised as a Lutheran, as far as I know. So it's not part of the Lutheran culture, really. It's not, you know, we're not, um, we, we don't go around knocking on doors generally. Uh, which I have problems with. Because the Holy Spirit does it. That's my experience is the Holy Spirit is the one who, and I found out that is actually the Lutheran position. So what, where am I? There happens to be this this one Lutheran church in town, and the the minister there, when he preaches, at least usually, uh, he, Christ is front and center. And that's what I want. I have two requirements for church, for church. In order for me to be comfortable there, Christ must be front and center and stay there. And two, I don't want two, <laughs> worship in spirit and truth. I don't want some frivolous, chinky, junky worship, which is what is dom which dominates fundamentalism and uh, well dominates Christianity in the United States pretty much. And there was been there's been so many times that even though the church I was raised in, I was not born again then, but. Uh, and it was going, I was already on the road to apostasy. I think when I was young, they still had one pastor that seemed to believe the Bible. The others didn't. The others didn't. And even after I got was saved and went back, born again, went back there, it's like, I can't stay here. This is impossible. It was just impossible. You're dead people. The leadership was all dead, spiritually dead. And, you know, there was, there was just no place there. It was They had joined the ELCA by then, and that was really stupid. But a carnal, carnal, seeking for power, seeking for security in numbers, building the Tower of Babel. That's denominational mergers, that's what it's all about. They don't understand unity. It, 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 unity in the church, the, the church has perfect unity because Christ is our unity. Koinonia. It's spiritual unity. They, uh, carnal men think that unity comes from agreement in all points and organizations and things like that. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, that's the, the carnality of Rome. And if you think that solves a problem, look what's going on there now. <laughs> Who has more bureaucracy and organization and structure than Roman Catholicism? And what's it doing? Is it is are they saved? No. Are they united to Christ? No. What are they doing? They're following Satan. Or trying to bail out. How can we bail out of this ship? This bark of Peter is sinking. A bark is a boat, by the way. Yeah, the bark of Peter is taking out water. Well, there's an answer to that. Uh, that happened before in the Sea of Galilee, and Peter cried out, Lord, save us! Yeah, that's what they need to, need to do. The Catholics need to cry out to the Lord to save them from Peter, the the one who claims to be Peter, the sits in seat. Yeah, the, the oarman that is sitting in Peter's seat, which would probably have been at the stern of the boat. At the tiller, yeah. yeah the, well, the the Francis has got the tiller, and he's, hey, see those rocks over there? We're going to go there. We're going to pile up in the rocks. Yeah, that's crazy. But anyway, this morning when I was, I, I woke and I was thinking, and all of a sudden, and I've been going in this direction. Do you? I don't know if you experience the same thing, but you're sort of moving in a way, and then all of a sudden, it's like the lights come on, or it just, the pieces fall into place, and you understand, you understand. Suddenly you understand with clarity what the problem is, or what the solution is. And that happened to me this morning. I was thinking about this, and I was sort of thinking about my life, and how I've gone all kinds of different places, and I could never find rest. 
Why? When I was saved, when I was born again, I was in the military, and there was something going on in this world, and it was called the Jesus Revolution. Uh, sometimes referred to as Jesus freaks, those were in it. And God, this was a spiritual movement of God. And it was not just in the United States, but it was even in Europe. Young people, my generation, who grew up post-World War II, the baby boomers. My parents, our parents, grew up during the Depression, the Great Depression. And then during World War II, they were generally too young to actually have fought in it, but they grew up in that environment. I mean, people in the United States, at least. Uh, then after the war, well, it's like the war never ended because there was this, <laughs> well, in the United States, I suspect that the uh, the thing that Eisenhower warned about, the military-industrial complex, people were making, businesses were making so much money on the war in the United States, World War II, that they wanted to keep the thing going. And so we were raised, my generation was raised in fear of imminent destruction, nuclear destruction. Now, now we know that that was not real. Uh, it's like Robert, or John Kennedy, when he ran for president, he was instilling fear of the missile gap, even though the President Eisenhower gave him the actual classified information and said there is no missile gap. The Russians are not ahead of us as far as these things. And uh, Kennedy ignored what Eisenhower said because it was working. He continued to preach fear. he scare people to vote for him. And behind the scene, though, there's this, this the love of money, the capitalism that, that just wants the money, the profits. They were making so much money, guaranteed profits in World War II. And then, they, the, of course, the Korean War came along. And then Vietnam, it was perpetual war. And my generation grew up, did, not during the Depression, but in prosperity. And so we had the material stuff. We weren't hungry. We had people were beginning to live in nice houses. It wasn't, you know, my grandparents lived all those years in rental houses. Uh, but no, my parents owned the houses. We had nice houses, usually new houses. Uh, never went hungry, ever. Uh, we had cars. I mean, my family, we were not rich. We had a lot of kids. There was uh, not an excess of money, but, and, and people that grew up in the Depression were pretty fugal, frugal, frugal about what they spent anyway. So uh, that's what I grew up with. It was, it was, in, 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 but I think in that time, we were, as a generation, we were asking questions Is this all there is to life? Is prosperity. And materialism, is this all there is? Because by that time, Christianity was sick, sick unto death in some ways, depending on the denomination. But the mainline denominations, there was, there was, it was just something you did on Sunday mornings. It had no reality to it, uh, at least to, to us, to me. God was out there. It's not that I didn't believe in God, but he was out there someplace. I did not know him. And so you went to church, you did the things, you went to Sunday school, you, you went through confirmation. Um, my first contact with the church after I was confirmed was somebody from the church calling me up asking, for me to pledge my tithe. I had a paper out. I was lucky to make $5 a week. And the first thing they do as, as a full member of the church, right? Because once you're confirmed, you're, you go to communion and all this stuff. You, they treat you as an adult, mostly. Unless it's legal issues that you're not of age to vote on, you know, things like that, um, financers or whatever. 
you know, because of because of, of the law, not because of uh, the church. And it's like that. So it, it, I was not happy about that. But I wasn't saved either. I wasn't saved. I didn't know Christ. I didn't belong to Him. I didn't belong to Him. I did not yet have saving faith, which is different than simple natural faith. But it was the '60s was a crazy wild time, and a lot of that was people were experimenting with all kinds of things: drugs, revolution, Maoism. Why? Because they were dissatisfied with good cause. With good cause, because it was materialism, whether whatever form it is, is a dead end. There's no life to it. Education is a dead end. There's no life to it. You know, pursuit of all the things of this world, it's, it's emptiness. And that generation, we began to feel that. And there was a lot of looking, seeking, the hippie movement, the, the drugs. All this stuff actually happened before in World War, prior to World War II. Uh, in the uh, German uh, period before Hitler, there was the the uh, they had their own hippie movement there and uh, pornography, uh, decadent society, all this stuff already existed in Berlin. So it's like America is today. And out of that came uh, what they call wunderlust, people, young people experimenting with all kinds of things because they were dissatisfied with what they saw. With there was no reality in the church. Uh, whether it was a Protestant church, the, the Lutherans, or the uh, or the Catholics in Germany. By the way, Hitler was a baptized Catholic, never excommunicated. And once that movement was in place, and all of a sudden there arose this spontaneous, supernatural thing where young people were were being called by Christ. There was a reason it was called the Jesus Revolution. Because it was all about Jesus. And during that period of time, and it was not a connected, organized thing at all. It was the work of the Spirit of God. And so all kinds of strange young people were being called out of that because they were looking for something more. They were not satisfied with the things of this world some of them at least, and they were found by Christ, and they found Christ. He took them out of that despair and brought them life, and it was different. And during that period, he found me, too. He knew exactly where I was. He brought me to himself, too, not because of the movement, but the movement of God. And it was all about Jesus. We were all about him. We were in love with Jesus. And the mainline churches, they looked at us and like, what is this? We don't know what to do with this stuff. Plus, we had something they didn't have, generally. I mean, it was, it was all about Christ, loving Christ. We were in love with Christ. It was all about him, Jesus. And there was some not particularly good teaching and leadership at times, but it was still, this, there was just this real, real revival, real Holy Spirit uh, revival, or the call. It was not really a revival. It was... God calling this generation to himself, this generation in despair from of the things of this world. It was simply, these do not fulfill life. And we realized that. And we found ourselves in him, some of us at least. And I was in the military at the time. And there was you know, other young people in the military, same thing. 
we came from all different things. What would we have in common? Christ, Jesus Christ. And it wasn't about organized religion at all. It was loving him, knowing him. And we searched the scriptures for Christ. And so then we, that generation grows up, begins to have a life and children and everything else, and we, we think we were, I don't know, where are we now? I went back to the, the, my sort of home church, the church I was baptized and confirmed in, and uh, it was even worse. It was dead. It was spiritually dead. It, um, in fact, I went there twice. I was uh, unsatisfied, and then even later I went back again. I thought, well, maybe I can share my experience and bring the reality of Christ into these this dead box or cathedral or whatever you call that thing. Uh, no, I basically was driven out. <laughs> basically was driven. They, they didn't want to have anything to do with me. I mean, that clear, well, was, no, I was considered disruptive, I think. So I ended up going other places. There was a Baptist church in, near, I bought a house, and there's a Baptist church a couple blocks away, and I went there, and it was, they talked about being born again and uh, loving Jesus and all this. So I thought, you know, that's better than that thing was. And, uh, but I never was at home there. And that's been my story for four, over 40 years. Uh, charismatic movement, worked with different churches, been involved in all kinds of things, pastored several churches. But there's always something out there. This morning, I realized what it was because, it's, because of this one minister in town. Because he preaches Christ and Christ crucified front and center. I mean, that is the core of his message. And it happens to be a Lutheran church. And I had a, a, a still had an aftertaste in my mouth from Lutheranism. And, and this was an e, uh, Lutheran church, Missouri Senate. And my in my extended family growing up, it was, I, I think I asked my mother, how come we don't go there? And she said, well, those are Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate. They're way too strict. So there was a definite, and there could have been ethnicity involved too. Because uh, Lutheran churches in, in the United States all started out as ethnic churches, German churches, Scandinavian churches. You have Swedish churches, you have Norwegian churches, you know, uh, German churches. And then they eventually became American. So you had the American Lutheran Church and the Lutheran Church of America, and they started using English instead of their other languages. But there was a definite, you know, it was not a, a place I would have. It was just not on the uh, menu for me. So I basically just, left Lutheranism. I thought the whole thing is bad. And now, out of desperation, because I heard this one pastor preach several times, and of course now with the with YouTube and streaming, most churches are, and the pandemic, most churches put their stuff on the screen. So you can sample, you know, it's just like not just one sermon, but you can go back, okay, what it does what does he preach consistently? And I visited there a couple of times and the, the liturgy is is I can recognize it, but it's not what I'm was it's not exactly what I remember. Of course, the ELCA, they had changed the liturgy too. It's just not good. It's not the one I remember growing up with. And the architecture in this building is like, must be straight out of 17th century Germany. I mean, it's, it looks more Catholic than a lot of Catholic churches. And complete with a crucifix for the processional. I don't 
think they did that in ALC. It was usually just a bare cross. But my, what I'm looking for was Christ. Again, it was Christ, just like the rest of those my brothers and sisters who were born again during that movement of the Holy Spirit called the Jesus Gen uh, Revolution. It was about Jesus. It wasn't about other things. It was about Jesus. And this morning, as I was thinking about that, I, it suddenly gelled. And I realized why I didn't feel at home with the fundamentalists or some of these other things, the Nazarenes or the charismatic movement or any of this other stuff, or with the apostate Lutheran church. And I'd, I'd been going through this, starting to work through this, because the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate, you have to subscribe, basically, to this book. Exactly what is entailed in that, I'm not quite sure yet. So I was looking through this and uh, beginning to work my way through. I'm about a third through it, I guess. It's it's just the historic uh, beginning traditions, the, the creeds, the confessions, which were a lot of it was um, apologetics too, were in, in opposite and trying to justify the Reformation, um, the teachings of the of the Lutherans which was not what Luther wanted them to be called at all. He would have preferred to be called Christians or evangelicals, but there was a tag put on him, just like Baptist is a tag, just like, you know. Uh, but as I was working through this, since, and I was, because I'm looking for, is there something in here that's going to break the deal? So there's no way I can, because I cannot participate fully in worship at the LCMS unless I'm a member or close enough that hold, that can hold to this and their view of, of the sacraments and things. So, but my commitment is to the scriptures, like Luther, which is my leverage, my leverage there, I guess. So you don't really follow Luther, huh? Fortunately, all the confessions are very much scripture is the authority. So... You've got you always have religious people, especially the denominations, that want to put their religion in. But fortunately, God provides an antidote there. But what what is, for example, like, like I was thinking this this, this um, fundamentalist Baptist church, which is not a bad one, not a bad pastor. Why well, not? And and the worship isn't well. They're you're going a bit modern. They're slowly moving in that direction. Uh, but there's still, they just the piano. It's not worship teams and this kind of stuff. That's like really this is not, not. Th this is appealing to the flesh. Not that traditional worship doesn't have elements that appeal to the flesh, but uh, in the architecture and other things. But but so what what happened this morning as I was thinking back over this? All of a sudden, I got it. I know I'm not happy there. And it has to do with when I was born again and the Jesus movement. What did I say? What's well, front and center? Jesus Christ. That's why that preacher, that pastor at that church, his sermons appeal to me so much because it's Christ front and center. That's what I want. That's what I require. And decent worship, dignified worship, something, something that is not totally flesh-centered and appeals to people. It's, you know, it's, and as I've gotten older, some of the things that I rejected when I was younger, uh, like the liturgy and everything, I'm thinking, hmm, out of experience and have been, having been a pastor and listened to countless sermons and how, how people that are supposed to be Bible believers end up going off in some direction other than pointing to Christ. Some of the structure that that sort of chains on the preacher, so he's like, "I got to do this because that liturgy thing." Yeah, including reading of the scriptures, 
which is very biblical, by the way. What it, but the public reading of Scripture occurs more in liturgical churches, all of them, Roman Catholicism, Orthodoxy, and Lutheran, and I assume Anglican, too. Um, Calvinism isn't really liturgical. <laughs> They're a different creature. Uh, but, it's, you know, the, so the Catholics, they've got, they've got the witness of God's Word. They've got readings from the Gospel and, and the Epistles and one reading from the Old Testament. they got three readings from the Scriptures every time they go to church. And what's front and center is part of the Catholic worship, not Mary. What's actually front and center is part, is is the remembrance. It's Christ crucified. It is the Eucharist. Now it's been muddied by tradition, but the fact still remains: Christ crucified for your sins. That is the object of that. See. Catholics are completely orthodox when it comes to Christ crucified and what he did on the cross. Completely orthodox. The, the issue is, how does that become our? How does his atonement become our atonement? That's where the stuff, the differences come in. That's where the gospel comes in. The gospel that was lost in Rome because it was through the sacraments and through your works. And Luther said, no, it's by faith. Faith alone. He was absolutely right. Absolutely right. But I was thinking back over the Baptist. Why am I uncomfortable here? They're biblical. They're focused on the Bible. That was it. That was it. I suddenly realized that Baptists are not Christ-centered. I'm generalizing, of course, but I've got a lot of experience with, especially fundamentalist Baptists. They're not Jesus-centered. They're Bible-centered. And I realized I was I was talking about this and sort of a dangerous thing to say, but so I was saying, like, this, this isn't speaking biblically, you, from the scriptures themselves, this isn't the word of God. Christ is the word of God. This is testimony to him. This points to him. Yes, it is inspired and inerrant, but it is not the focus of our worship. This does not save us. Christ saves us. This is not Christ. This is a book of testimony about Christ including his words, including the words of the apostles, including the words of the prophets. It all points to him. This is the gift wrapping, not the gift itself. But Baptists focus on this. They are Bible-centered. Bible-centered, not Christ-centered. Which is why... Baptist preachers love to preach out of the Old Testament because it's the biggest part of the book and allows them to say whatever they want. And, and because, like fundamentalists, they're dispensationalists, almost all of them. Unless you have a fundamentalist. I, when, I don't know of one fundamentalist Baptist that's not dispensationalist. Even the Calvinistic ones are dispensationalists. The Calvinistic fundamentalists are as rare as hen's teeth. <laughs> but they're non-existent, practically. There's a few around, but they're not really, you know, they're they're oddballs. Like, they're really piperists. John Fowler's a piper or something like that. They're not really. Uh, t historically, that wasn't true. Historically... Baptists came out of the of the English Reformation. They were uh, came out of the the Calvinists, so they were historically Calvinists. Uh, then they got into in the United States, got mixed with, with revivalism and everything else, and out of that brew came uh, what we have today. But why am I not comfortable there? Because they're not Christ-centered. They're Bible-centered. 
Not that there's a problem with the Bible, but that's not the center. Christ is. Salvation is in Christ. If salvation is not in the Bible, because you believe the Bible, you're, you're not saved because you believe in the Bible. You're saved because you believe in Christ. That's a major distinction. It's the same as in Roman Catholicism. Those that believe in the church rather than believe in Christ, they're not saved. It's Christ himself is the object of your faith. If anything else is, are you saved? If you're not, you're, I wouldn't think so because you're not trusting in Christ. Uh, again, what I grew up with wasn't Christ-centered. It was not. It was religion, dead religion. They didn't really, it got so bad they didn't really believe in Christ. They believed in, the, the pastors believed in uh, higher critical theology and that garbage. They didn't believe the testimony of scriptures about Christ. They, uh, they bought into unbelief. Liberalism, liberal, uh, modernism, theology, dead theology, literally dead theology. There's no life there. But so Baptists are Bible centered. That's why I'm never comfortable there completely. It's like I'm partially comfortable because it's Bible centered, because it's Bible, they believe the Bible's authoritative. And sufficient, yes, but it's not Christ. Their focus isn't on Christ; it's on the Bible, uh, on the Bible generally, not on what the Old Testament says about Christ. But it's like the pastor going over there decided he was going to go through Daniel. I don't care about Daniel. I love Jesus. I don't love Daniel. I love Jesus. I don't know Daniel. I know Jesus. I've re I've read the Book of Daniel many times. Okay, but yeah, yeah, he's. I can talk to him in heaven sometime, but he's not my focus. When I when I come before the Lord, when I go to heaven or wherever, I'm not going to be looking for Daniel. Show me Christ. I want to see my Savior, the one who died for me. I don't care about the rest of you. But later, Christ Christ is what holds us together. He is our unity. And my generation, those who Christ called to themselves, the Jesus revolution, the ones that were real, there, there were a lot of false conversions too. They were looking for something. They, they, they glommed onto the movement, but they didn't actually belong to Christ. That he, Jesus is what held us together. We didn't need an organization. The love of Christ, which is what I've seen in this pastor. I've talked to him. I, he's my brother. I know he's my brother. I can see it in him. When he speaks Christ, he, he lights up. I can do that, too. <laughs> but it's just like he's excited about Christ. But the Baptists, the Bible is centered. I'm generalizing from long experience with many different Baptist churches and Baptist missionaries and everything else. So I can speak with a bit of authority here. Visited dozens of Baptist churches especially fundamentalist Baptists, because the Southern Baptists are, like, not worth bothering with. From my experience with them, no, because I'm not going to hear Christ there, or the Bible, usually. <clears throat> so, but I want Christ. That's my requirement. It must be, Christ must be front and center. I want to worship in spirit and truth. We have to worship in spirit and truth, which means it's not man-centered, Frivolous, people-pleasing worship. Frivolous music that doesn't honor Christ. I want the great hymns that honor 
him, that had been honoring him for a thousand years or hundreds of years. Not this garbage, the top ten this month kind of garbage that so many of the churches are going to. And the Nazarenes, what was the problem with the Nazarenes? Well, after being there almost a year, I was like, hmm, there's something not right here. Why am I always complaining about the sermon? Why do I leave the sermon, the, the service, worse than when I came? I finally realized it. They're not preaching Christ and Him crucified. It's not about Christ. It's about holiness and moralism and calling down the Spirit, meeting, oh, Spirit, meet our needs. Christ, Christ, come and serve me, literally. Christ as our servant. I'm looking at their denominational stuff as wanting to vomit. Just barf. Because, you know, it's like the book of Proverbs, the good wife versus the strange woman. Do you know what I mean? Why would, you know, one one is your the love of your heart, and the other is that. That, that is not something that can ever satisfy you. No, it's, it's not real. It's not of God. Only God can satisfy. Only God. And so I was thinking, huh, but... If it's only this pa one pastor at this particular church, can I commit myself to this? Okay. So <clears throat> the, the Lutheran uh, Church, Missouri Senate, is as strong in the scriptures any fundamentalist Baptist. They're not King James only, but they, they're holding the line on that stuff. But. So I was going through this, and I discovered a Lutheranism I never knew. The, Lu the Lutheranism of Luther and of that time, which was a really difficult time. And I had ideas that were from other sources and from myself. Again, I had a little bit of a bad aftertaste from what I, what I grew up with. So I'm trying to re go through this and understand it, and I keep, like, reading things and say, yes, yes, yes. There's some things in there, eh, I don't know. What are they trying to say? And then I'll read down farther. Oh, okay, it's all right there. When they clarify things a little bit, but it's like, yes. It's Christ-centered. It's not just that pastor. Lutheranism is Christ-centered. Real Lutheranism is Christ-centered, much more so than Calvinism. Much more so than Calvinism. And certainly more so than fundamentalist Baptists. Bible-centered is not the same as Christ-centered. You almost have to be—I mean, you have to believe the Bible because— it's the testimony of Christ. But that is, like I said, it's like the gift wrapping. It's not the gift itself. It is Christ. If you get all entranced, you know, people, have you ever seen somebody, adults do this, at Christmas, oh, that is such a nice packaging, I almost hate to tear it open. Yeah, that's where fundamentalist Baptists are. Not even going to talk about Southern Baptists. <laughs> They're so focused on the Scripture, they, they don't grasp at the gift that the Scripture points you to, which is Christ. The Nazarenes, they have no understanding of the gospel. You're allowed to believe the gospel there. It's like, oh. 
I mean, I don't know. I can be a pain in the rear end because, I mean, I confronted the pastor before the service because he didn't answer my calls, my text messages. So I went there. Where can I find this guy? So I went there before the service when he comes came in, and I confronted him when he was coming in. And I think the service was delayed by about 10 minutes that day. Confronting him over the gospel. Because they don't believe that they have the righteousness of Christ. It is their own righteousness that they seek. That is exactly what Rome teaches. That's why I was miserable there. It wasn't because the people were sour or anything, but That's why when I was preaching on the New Covenant, they were looking at me like, what's he talking about? Now I know. So this will be interesting. See if the doors are locked again or not. But yeah, I, I as I because I was afraid. Well, there's going to be some deal breaker here, and it's not going to. But so far, at least when I read this and I'm seeking to understand what the real message is, again, there's a lot of historical stuff, a lot of sit things that are dependent on the situation. But uh, I think it is Christ-centered. That's the real message: Christ-centered, gospel-centered. Even even my what my understanding of infant baptism was, or baptism in general among them, uh, sacramentalism. But the fact is, and I know the pastor there could not refute this at all, that without faith in Christ, the sacraments mean nothing. They're not ex opera operato, as the, the Catholics, they operate of themselves. No, without faith in Christ, they mean nothing. Nothing. And that's something I might have to correct him on because, or some things in here, because they seem to point to faith in the sacrament at times. And that pastor has made comments like that. And I mentioned it to him before, and he said, Yeah, I probably should have worded that differently. But yeah, he might need me there too to keep him on the correct way at times, as we all do. We need someone, a brother or sister, that can correct us and say, You know, because we might think we're saying one thing, and people out there might be hearing something else. So that's where I'm looking now, because that's what I require, Christ front and center and true worship. A good church is a difficult thing to find, like a good wife. 